now in session with the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. I'm Lisa Gullickson. Hey, I'm Brad Gullickson. And each month we evaluate a different iconic romance within the four color realm. For this panel, we are going to discuss what puts the funk in the dysfunctional family unit in the Umbrella Academy. And our very special guest, Liz Reed from Cuddles and Rage is going to help us. And because we are not experts, we're going to refer to extraordinary relationships, oh. a new way <laughs> of thinking about human interactions by Dr. Roberta M. Gilbert. Look yeah, at that so, sweet graphic. <laughs> yeah, sweet graphic. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, if you don't know who we are, we are the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. Uh, Lisa and I have been married for 10 years. No. 11 years. 11 years. Not that anybody's counting. We've been together for 13 years, Lisa, though. I knew that number. That is true. Um, and that's the extent of our um, expertise, really. And that's why we need books like Dr. Roberta M. Gilbert to help us get through these comic book relationships so that we can talk about them with some kind of authority. So what we do is we take some of our favorite comic book couples mm -hmm. like Scott Summers and Jean Grey and we pair them with a relationship book like The Five Love Languages. Mm -hmm. We've also done Marco and Alana from Saga. That was Men, men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Uh, my favorite that we just did was Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy and we used Lindsay King Miller's Ask, Ask a, a Queer Shirt. That book is great. Yeah, uh, But that's not all we do. We also have a creator corner where we invite uh, comic book artists and writers such as Tom Scioli, Stephen Bissett, Kevin Eastman. Liz Reed and Jimmy Reed from Cuddles, Cuddles and Rage. And Rage. <laughs> right, and so we're really excited to have Liz join the panel today. Liz, give, give, give our watchers, our listeners, a little info on who you are. Oh, well, thank you for having me on your show. I love it. I listen to your podcast all the time, especially the Gambit and Rose. No, Rogue, Rogue. <laughs> Give it a Rogue uh, season that you did. Um, so yeah, my name is Liz Reed. I am one part of Cuddles and Rage. And um, we're probably best known for our food humor and diorama style. And uh, we just recently in March uh, put out our first graphic novel with Quirk Books, Bites of Terror, um, which I chatted to you guys about, I guess, like right when it came out. Yes, so if you guys want to hear a more in-depth conversation with Liz and Jimmy and glean some of that, you know, life advice from them mm -hmm. using comics to make ourselves better, yeah. I suggest going back and uh, listening to that episode from March. Yeah, and I feel like um, one day if you, you guys could... Uh pair a book with Bites of Terror, since it is like a Ooh. comic, I'd be curious on what book you would pair us with. There are a <laughs> lot of really interesting couples in here too. Dysfunctional, uh, <laughs> a lot in the ways that the Umbrella yeah. Academy is. I'm looking at that watermelon family. I think yeah. there's a lot oh, yeah. in common with uh, the Hargreaves. Um, there's but a lot yeah, of love so there too though, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of love too, uh, Cuddles and Rage. Um, I do have <laughs> So I do have one question for you, Liz, that has come up since reading Roberta M. Gilbert's book. And it has to do with um, the basic self versus the functional self. So your mm. basic self is who you are all of the time. It's who you are when you're alone. And it's the parts of yourself that are non-negotiable. And then there's your functional self, which is the part of yourself that you present and can change depending on how you want to function within a group. Mm -hmm. And you and Jimmy, you have some very different audiences. You have your Cuddles and Rage audience, which is horror. It can be pretty dark, always food-related and cute. But yeah. then you have your HarperCollins children's books, mm -hmm. Sweet Press and Sweet Competition. And that's a whole separate part of your audience. So. I'm wondering it like as an artist and as cuddles and rage as the reads, what would you consider part of your basic self, the part of your mm -hmm. art that is the same all of the time and your functional self, the part of your art that you change in order to appeal to a different audience? Oh, okay. Well, um, 
I guess the part that I can't change would be just being like goofy and quirky. <laughs> I, mean, like, I, can, I can be in the house alone and still run into a wall. <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel like I just embrace it. Um, and it comes out in our humor and especially in doing, you know, shows like Awesome Con when you're interacting with people. Um, it's just like, I like to think of it as fun goofiness, but also just as awkward as when I reach over to hug somebody and all my sculpts go falling, <laughs> you know, it's like, I can't, I can't be graceful. Um, so that translates into a lot of, um, reflective comics and just like embracing your awkwardness. Uh, so that usually comes through in our work. And then the second part to your question, um, the the one that is kind of more like forward facing and then private facing, um, I would say <laughs> I am real, in my private life, I am a huge pessimist. But uh. in my public life and like with Cuddles and Rage, um, I mean, we don't need any more negativity. So I weed all that out and and try to only put like the good positive energy out into the world. Um, so like the reason why Cuddles and Rage functions is that my partner, who is the opposite of me in some ways, Jimmy, he's very optimistic. So when I say, no, we can't do something, he's like, yes, you can. Oh, uh, and it's worked out for us so far. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, to, to your point, hope and optimism is a practice. It's something that you have to work towards. It doesn't just happen. And I find like with every passing day of lockdown, I'm working at hope and optimism. Yeah. Um, and you got really got to push that out there into the world. The us Brene Brown fans know that hope is an action. It's not an emotion. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Uh, but we're very thankful to be here uh, hosting this panel at Awesome Con. We love Awesome Con. We yeah. have been going to it every year since it began. Yeah. And, you know, uh, even though we can't all be there in person, I'm just really impressed and uh, motivated by the sense of community that comic conventions have, that Awesome Con has. And, you know, it allows us to continue our obsessive conversations about things like the Umbrella Academy, right? Yes. Uh, which is a new discovery for me. Um, I, you know, the Umbrella Academy, uh, uh, the comic book is written by Gerard Way and illustrated by Gabriel Ba, is something that for whatever reason, maybe because I'm a little bit of a snob or, or leery of celebrities coming into my favorite medium and mucking about, uh, I was, resistant towards the Umbrella Academy. And for the longest time, I, I didn't read the Umbrella Academy. Thankfully, I'm married to this lovely lady who's less of a snob and knows to celebrate and recognizes good things uh, when they appear. And you read the comic and fell in love yeah, immediately. I, I, I jumped in right with the first volume. And uh, I, I totally picked up the book because of my chemical romance. I may not look it, I'm a little emo kid deep down on the inside. I have, I've marched amongst the black parade. So um, I was interested to see his kind of take on the idea of a mutant. Mm. And I, when um, I read that first volume and it was so good. I was like, am I looking at this through my chemical romance fandom colored glasses. <laughs> Can I trust how I how awesome I feel this book is? But then I gave it to Brad and we just became fans. I mean, we really enjoy it. Yeah. We love the art as well as the the written part of the storytelling. Yeah. I, I, I am in love with the Umbrella Academy as a comic book. Um and uh I, what I, what I love about it is you mentioned X Men mutants. Yeah. And when you read those old '60s comics, uh, illustrated by Jack Kirby, um, when you read those comic books, uh, sometimes Professor X, you're like, he's not a great father figure. He's. Oh, he, I take him as my dad. No, but like in the '60s themselves, you know, he's throwing these kids into Krakoa. They're teenagers. You know, he's putting them in harm's way with Magneto. You're like the danger room has a safety off. Yeah. Like, that is a pretty good. And, and, and what, I, what I love about the Umbrella Academy is that it takes those like 60s uh, parental figure and, and really goes like, well, let's show a real bad dad real with, with some superhero children. Uh, and it highlights everything that I loved of those 60s comics. And, uh, um, and has... but with a lot of sci-fi charm, mm -hmm. hyper violence. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Yeah. How but, about you, Liz? What do you think of the Umbrella Academy? What is your journey with them? Um, well, 
I only listened to soundtracks, so I wasn't as familiar with Gerard Way and his band. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like the grandma. I'm like, he's in a band. <laughs> what is it? No, I just <laughs> love the band. I just didn't listen to it. So I didn't come in with that same um, background of, uh, you know, a musician writing a comic. Um, but I, I will go into it saying that, you know, I heard so much about the show. It, it's kind of like one of those things where you hear so much about like Casablanca or like somebody's favorite movie. You're like, I don't know if you know, if I want to see it, because you've heard, you feel like you already know it. So I went into it um, feeling like, okay, I'm going to sit back, like, tell me, tell me what I'm missing out on. And I was shocked by like the amazing humor in it. Like I didn't realize like how much, how much I would be laughing. And then the, mm -hmm. the play with playing with your emotions and it being like, I mean, I think tonally it really gets it right where it's like really sarcastic or then it's like really kind of serious. And I, that's a really hard thing to mix. So I think Gerard is a really good writer. And um, I think it's exciting when you look into like the back of the, the volumes and he talks about how like he doesn't have it all mapped out. I mean, that's pretty amazing for somebody yeah. to just kind of like go with their gut <laughs> and create a story that's so vast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm in awe of Gerard Way as a writer. Uh, you know, everything that he's done. World building. Yeah, everything that he's done with Umbrella Academy, but also what he's gone on to do with DC's Young Animal line with Doom Patrol and, you know, Cave Carson and Mother Panic. Like, he is a world builder and he's the real deal. And how dare I ever dismiss him as some celebrity uh, coming into comic books. Those of you who might be watching this panel because you are, have watched the TV show and perhaps have not visited the comic book. We're gonna be making lots of references to the comic book, but I think they, and the events of which are not identical, mm -hmm. but I think the spirit of the characters and a lot of the characters' emotional impulses do cross translate between um, the two mediums. Yeah. So if you're like, I'm not here for the comics, like the characters are still essentially the same. And I highly recommend the comic if you're enjoying the show, because I enjoy the show a lot. And, and I think that it, it um, if you have it in your heart for the TV show, you're also probably going to like oh, the comic. Yeah, for sure. For they sure. share a lot of DNA. Would you, would yeah, you agree with that, Liz? What I want to add is that, you know, when you describe the comic as being like hyper violent, um, when you go to the Netflix version, mm -hmm. it is not that. And so I feel like if you wanted to watch it with your family, you can do that with the Netflix version. I think with the comic, um, you you might want to preview it beforehand, before giving it to young heads. I feel like I'm so used to saying this at comic conventions with our different books. I'm like, this one you might want to read first <laughs> before you pass it around to a young child. Um, but yeah, oh, yeah. I, think, I think the Netflix one is a lot more family friendly. I mean, there is some violence in it. Um, but I, I do agree with what you're saying with like the core of our conversation today, like the characters, um, they do tend to have like the similar motivations. It's just what happens is different, which I always find fascinating to compare to whether, you know, it's a TV show or oh, even yeah. a movie adaptation of a novel or a graphic novel. It's, it's cool to see what bits they take out and what bits they kind of try and put their own spin on. Yeah. yeah I mean, there, it's like, there, it feels like season one, in particular, it feels like a, a a French braid of a little bit of volume one, a little bit of volume two. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. So much on the show, uh, I, I love them. Um, okay, so let's get into the heart of the conversation. And for those watching, uh, we are going to do a Q and A at the end, and so you can start putting in questions to ask us, whether it's about the comic book series uh, or or the TV show. Or, or by, our podcast. Or by Bites of Terror. That's right. Yeah, so you can feel free to do that. Drop those down below. Uh, but Lisa, let's talk about Roberta M. Gilbert. Before we get into the conversation with the comic, we need some context of what Roberta M. Gilbert is saying in her book, Extraordinary Relationships. I think Extraordinary Relationships is a great in on the dysfunction that is in the Umbrella Academy. She uses a therapy modality that is called the Bowen Family Systems Theory. And the way that this works is they look at groups of people, perhaps a family, perhaps an academy, as an emotional unit that passes intense emotions or anxiety from person to person. So 
when humans are under stress, they have what she calls a togetherness force, a force that pulls them together uh, for support. But when um, the emotional system becomes overwhelmed, then there is the opposite individuality force that pulls groups apart. I like to think about it as everybody's walking around with a little emotional sponge and <laughs> the issues of life, the stress of life, is like water like if you have a big spill it's nice to have a lot of dry sponges emotional sponges to clean that mess up lots of spills lots of spills in lots life of spills. but when all of your emotional sponges have become saturated they're they don't help anymore and a lot of the time they can make the, the mm. situation worse um mm. So like um, when you're by looking at a family, so by looking at a family as an emotional unit through the Bowens family systems theory, you get to, you start to see universal patterns form of how people are going, are being pulled together and how people are being pulled apart. And so by recognizing these patterns, we can then anticipate them and choose to act differently so that we're reacting thoughtfully to crisis or instead of reacting impulsively. Mm -hmm. So, um, we've got our notes. So we've got our notes. Ooh. <laughs> so when an individual in an emotional unit becomes overwhelmed by anxiety, they fall into four predictable postures that I call the postures of overwhelmingness. So they are conflict, distance, over-functioning, under-functioning, reciprocity, and triangling. So what I think would be helpful for the individuals in the Hargreaves family is that we, um, I'll, I'll say what each of these postures are, and then we can have a little conversation of which characters fall under these different um, postures. Like mm. what's what's each character's default emotional mm. posture when mm. they're feeling overwhelmed? Mm. Does that sound well, good? Yes, but can we add in where you think you fall into? Cause um, I, want some, I want some TMI in this panel. <laughs> well, I'm, ready, I'm ready to spill some tea if you are. I mean, um, yeah. I think all right, I'll bring it. And then yeah. we'll see like which one of the like dysfunctional children you're the most like, which is cool too. Oh, yeah. Yes, that sounds great. All right, do you want to just say, do you want to start with what we think our own posture is, or do you want to go through the postures Let, and then raise go, your hand? Let's go through, oh, that's funny. <laughs> I mean, let's go through the postures. We'll discuss okay. the characters, and then okay. we can discuss ourselves. Okay, all right. Okay, so the first one is conflict. So conflict, in the sponge metaphor, conflict is like, don't you dare get water on me. So... A lot of times we think of conflict as like explosive arguments and spouting insults, mm -hmm. which is a thing that happens, but it can be any any of the ABCs of conflict. So A's is accusation, B's is blame, and C is criticism. Mm -hmm. So like immediately with conflict, the person in the Umbrella Academy that I think of is I think of Diego and how he will uh, immediately fall into uh, the pattern of insulting people, you know, he'll, he'll mm -hmm. call Luther monkey boy, or, you know, space boy, monkey boy, because of his condition, um, his really rad body. I love that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. I love it too. Yes. Yeah. And in the TV show, um, towards the end of the series, when he goes out dancing and he, you know, he, he's had a little too much, too many funny pills, uh, and he's like dancing bare chested and he's just loving his body on the dance floor. I love that. Luke. Love it. So I'm Team Luther. Diego, stop stop making fun of him. What about you, Liz? Who do you well, think is conflictual? I had Diego on there as well. I think that's pretty accurate. I mean, he's just kind of like off doing his own thing. And he's still like a badass in his own way. Um, but I have to agree with Brad. Like, Space Boy, like, that's my baby. <laughs> um, especially in the comic. I just love the design so much. And um, when they translated that into the TV show, um, it was cool to see, like, they they, they didn't 
change his character at all. Like they embraced what it was. Um, so yeah, don't, don't make fun of my little space boy, Diego, but I understand that's how you're releasing how you express yourself. And I think we can all relate to it a little bit. I have a Diego question real quick. It's okay. a little off topic, okay. a little off topic, but Diego's called the Kraken, right? Mm -hmm. And he throws knives. But Ben was the squid boy. Yeah, I right? have this like, issue too. Why is Ben not the Kraken? Oh, because um, I have done my research. Because um, right. Diego can hold his hold his breath underwater. So right. I still think that the define like when you think Kraken, you don't think man he can hold his breath. Kraken is like mm. okay. <laughs> well, that's really cool <laughs> looking. So <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah, obviously yeah. Broadway is like a huge fan of like the octopus like squid family. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's got some very housed in some HP Lovecraft love. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm here. I'm I'm cool with that because I'm into it too. The so. defining conflictual action of Diego is at the funeral of uh, Sir Hargreaves. Mm. He pulls the coat off of the frame of the mother, <gasps> exposing her robotic insides as like provocative behavior. Like clearly he's anxious that his whole family is together. And mm. so the only way he can handle it is to begin a fight, mm. to start a fight with his family. Oh, so I, I love that part in the comic so much. I was I was waiting for that to happen in the show. <laughs> and I was going like, these tears are real. I'm like, oh, my tears are real. <laughs> okay. the second one is distance. So distance is like, my sponge is full of breath raising it's in. My sponge is full of water. Mm. So get all of your water. Like I, I don't want to be anywhere near water anymore. So um the behaviors can be so it can be physical distance, like somebody who spends a lot of extra time at work or finds excuses to travel or just or just being in a separate room. It can also be emotional distance. So that's talking, so like when you're being emotionally distant, you don't allow access to your emotions and you also don't ask for access to other people's emotions. And then it can also be chemically distant. So if you have an overuse of drugs or alcohol or any kind of escapist substance, uh, that can be considered distance behavior. I went first last time, so Liz should go. Liz, Liz should go Oh, first. okay. Well, I have two two bits to this. Um, I'll start with the first. Um, I think Klaus yeah. is distance and cut off. I mean, obviously with the substance abuse, but also just with um, him not really, he's never, even in the comic, like he's never really around his family. He's, he's, he's in the comic, but he's always off kind of like doing something else. And when he is around, um, he's not like inserting himself as much in the conversation. Um, so I, I think that that one's kind of an obvious one. Um, and my <laughs> second part is that I'm in this category. Let's shut off our emotions. <laughs> yeah. well, like, literally like he will create distance with literal silence. Like he, he like, he's like the conversation has now stopped. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a control thing, by the way, Brad. So <laughs> we're, we're addressing it. This is yeah. a, a grill. We're grilling. We're, we're yeah. I'm, I'm working on it. But I, I definitely like when we get into an argument on those uh, rare occasions. I will shut down. I will remove myself from the room. I'll go do work in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go for a car ride. I'll escape. The funniest thing about distancing is like. I am not a distancer, mm. so he will go and he'll get his emotional distance, and then he'll return and he feels better. But I wasn't done fighting, so I was just continuing the argument. <sighs> with myself. Guess what? I, 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 you are, you are Jimmy. That is the same way, and so you gotta, you gotta put the timer on. You gotta be like, I need ten minutes. I'll be back in ten. But then I'm bad because then I'll be like. It's 10 minutes. I'm like, I can go another five minutes. <laughs> now, do you think, do you think that Klaus would do that too? I think he would totally do that. He'd be like, oh, yeah. 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 I mean, for me, uh, Klaus was like my number one pick, but then mm -hmm. you have to think about the father figure. You have to oh, think yeah. about Hargreaves and, you know, he numbered his children, you know, <laughs> 
One, two, three, four, five, said, six, seven. Don't you dare call me dad. Yeah, don't call me dad. I'm not going to call you anything but a number. And like, that's the most uh, epic, egregious, repulsive form of distancing that I've seen. Well, to me, I've seen the guy who weaponizes the four postures, mm. right? He creates conflict in between the siblings. He creates, like, he purposefully distances Vanya from the rest of her family by isolating her out. Mm -hmm. So like, I, to me, I like, and, and especially with his, uh, his, like his motivations are unclear. Like he wants to save the world, but whether he has emotions of his own is, uh, you know, un debatable. Yeah, yeah. You know, so like, he's like, I think that he has, kind of ingrained these postures into his children, his adopted children, as a way to uh, get predictable outcomes from but them. I think there's a huge difference between the comic book Hargreaves and the television show yes. Hargreaves mm -hmm. that happens on page two of the comic book. Uh, so like, this is not a big spoiler for the comic book. It's page two. But on page two, you learn <laughs> that Hargreaves is a space alien. He's right. not from Earth. So we and, can't really apply him right, to exactly. the human <sighs> theory but rules. I, I, you know, we're going to get season two, and I wonder, like, is that going to come up, or is that just something that the Netflix show is just like we're not dealing with that at all? I mean, that would give it a totally different vibe, which right. you know happens in shows. Mm -hmm. But you're right; that is a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Uh, all right. uh, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say I feel bad because I was I almost started crying when you guys were like he numbers his children because they reminded me of my my brother, my niece, uh, nieces and nephew. Like my brother kept having kids. I was like I was numbering them. It's not horrible. Oh, no. I, call them, I call them by their names, but they, he has a lot of children. <laughs> no. I also have uh, many nieces and nephews. I've learned all their names, and we've learned all of their names. We're just in practice. <laughs> <laughs> And I do have nicknames. No, that's not true. I don't call anyone <laughs> attractive. Yeah. I think also number five is a distancer. It's, yeah. He popped into the future to get a little space and individualization, but then he ended up with a lot more distance than he bargained for. Yeah, be careful. Yeah. I think that's fair too. Oh, I'm trying to pull some number five cosplay by feeling like I'm in a student outfit, even though I look like oh. I'm about to play tennis. I, was like, I this can is a college it. shirt. <laughs> I, I feel I like I love him too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he's right. my favorite. I mean, in the TV series, he's my favorite character. That kid actor is yes. yeah. Oh my gosh, I want to see that kid in everything for real. Yeah. Like, he's so yeah. good. Okay, so the third posture is overfunctioning, underfunctioning reciprocity. So that's one sponge saying, like, clearly I'm the only sponge capable of cleaning up all of this water. Mm -hmm. And so you don't worry about it because I'm taking care of everything. And then the under functioner is the one who's saying, oh, I guess everything is taken care of. And I'm not even capable of cleaning up water. So I can't even be of a help in the situation. Mm -hmm. So um, you I, should go first this time. Because uh, I am an over functioner. <laughs> I was the person who was like, no, friends, we need an outline. And we need to be <laughs> you know, so I, I have mean, the outline she sent me. <laughs> the hideousness of an overfunctioner is because I send you an outline and then you go like, well, clearly I'm not capable of having a conversation on my own. And then I've created an underfunctioner. And for that, I apologize. We appreciate it. <laughs> but my um, there are lots of over functioner, under functioner relationships in the Umbrella Academy. I think that Dr. Hargreaves, in particular, with all of his children, used a certain amount of over functioning, going like, I understand your powers better than you. Mm -hmm. I understand the mission better than you. And therefore, you have to rely on me because mm -hmm. I know what's going on and you don't know what's going on. So I think that he is a major over functioner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so you can be, you know, a little bit of an overfunctioner. You can be a little bit of a distancer. You I see myself in each of the postures depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. Uh, I mean, as an underfunctioner, I mean, the seance, yeah. I think, is a big-time underfunctioner. But I think he could be a distancer, too. And, and he serves his underfunction by going like, well, what could I possibly do? My body is full of drugs. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I should say that's Klaus. The seance that's Klaus. is Klaus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Klaus. Yeah, yeah, Klaus. Yes. 
Uh, it's so funny because you can, you know, the first time I read the comic, there were three names for every character. A know? number and then yeah. two. Yeah, <laughs> well, you need a little cheat sheet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or a, a list, a big list. Uh, but yeah, Cloud, uh, the seance, and I don't remember his number. I, I think He's number a, four. Is a number, is an under function. Yeah, sure. I do have a. You do have I a do have a. Oh, I think what? I have a tab here. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't have their but, numbers. Wikipedia, get their numbers yeah. on there. <laughs> but 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 yeah. So I think he's an underfunctioner. I think he does. Um, you know, he kind of relishes that about himself. That's how he distances himself too by being an underfunctioner. Yeah, I think also Vanya like was trying like You're because taking... she didn't have superpowers. They often like she often felt like she was an underfunctioner, but then. She ended up going into more distance and cutoff posture by emotionally distancing herself herself by writing that tell all book mm -hmm. and then moving away from her family. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've listed a bunch of things for underfunctioners and overfunctioners. Have we stolen all of them? Have we taken yours? Uh, no, I'm way y'all are way off on what I have. Just Ooh, what so I, I, I want to get into some discussion here. Um, oh, please. I think because I I viewed it as um people who are kind of tied together. So you have an over-functioner and an under-functioner and they're kind of like paired together. So I automatically put um, Space Boy, Luther and Allison together. Yeah. So I think Luther is over-functioning. I mean, he went to the moon because his dad said so. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't <laughs> like, yeah, I'd be like, what happened to dad? I'm gonna do what I want. Yeah. Um, and he's like, feels like he has to take on everything and be the leader because he's number one. You know, it's like the first child. Um, so I think that's where he falls into. And I don't think, um, he fills his own cup as no right. enough. Um, and then where Allison comes in, which I think is like less obvious, um, in terms of the under functioning, like, yeah, like she's around and she's doing stuff, you know, especially in the TV show. But, um, I think that there's more to her divorce. And I think it's really interesting that the husband has custody. The husband's Eric, right? Um, mm -hmm. He has custody of their daughter, Claire, because he doesn't want the mom, like, using her power on their daughter. Um, so I think that when you have a power, like Rumor, um, and you use that, obviously, in the TV show, she uses it to become an actress, like... Obviously, she, I mean, it made me feel like she doesn't like want to work work her way up. So when right. you're able to manipulate people like that, do you ever have to truly function? And I think if you, um, this might happen later on in our conversation in this panel, but you might be able to see that she never really addresses other people's feelings as much. Like in the TV show, she totally does. Mm -hmm. um, but in the comic, I don't, um, I don't have as many scenes where she's kind of acknowledging somebody else's in pain. Um, outside of her situation of missing her daughter. I think like towards um, volume two of the Umbrella Academy and how she reacts to the white violin to Vanya after her transformation. Yes. Uh, and I think also um, uh, uh, she's more featured in the volume three of the Umbrella Academy. And we get a little bit more of that there too. But I think especially in volume one, uh, the rumor is I don't want to say an unlikable character, but um, she she has she has built walls around her through her ability because she has like this shame about yeah, her ability. Yeah, I think also. That it, that's what it comes down to. She's morally conflicted mm. by what she can and should do mm. because she is like a one sentence brainwasher. She can change. <laughs> yes. people you can change people's reality in a half a second. Well, and the revelation in the comic um, that she used her gift on her child, like that was a slap across this reader's face. I mean, I was really shocked by that. But at the same time, like beautifully shocked. Like what, if yeah. you had that ability and you were a mother, how could you not use that ability? Frankly, if I had that ability, I, you know, I would do probably a lot worse things. I don't know. But I, I think that that's a, an excuse that she does use to under function. Because she goes like, well, if I use my power, yeah. 
I am cre like I'm creating a false reality and nobody wants that, do they? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that she does use her guilt as as a, an ex not an excuse, but like yeah, as an a excuse. Crutch, yeah. As a crutch to un yeah. under function. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. I just know that if I had her power, I would be like, I heard a rumor you made me a cake. I would want to do it every day. <laughs> yeah, a lot of my rumors would also be baked good related. <laughs> Mine would all be collectible related. Oh, that's <laughs> probably. I gotta get the back to number one. <laughs> so the last one is triangling. And triangling mm. is, um, if we use the sponge metaphor one more time, like, how could we talk about all of the water that's around me if there's all of that water over there? So what a triangle triangular does is uses other people's problems or other life issues as a way to talk around or avoid talking about your actual personal issues. So who do we think are the triangulars in the Umbrella Academy? Do we, do we come back to Brad? I've like, yeah, it's back I mean, to I you, right? Can, I can start. Uh, and again, like, I don't know if this is his primary um, if it, posture. It, posture. Thank you. I don't know if it's his primary posture, but there are definitely scenes where he falls into it. And that's Luther's mm -hmm. Space Boy, Ooh. where, you know, because of who he is uh, in this um, simian suit, in this gorilla suit. Not suit, like it's his body, his, body. his gorilla body. Uh, his sweet, sweet body. He, he, he has like he has to make everything else uh, an issue. Like, um, what am I saying? Like, superheroism, uh, being team leader. That's his only option, and so he looks to all those areas rather than looking inward or in his relationships with his family members. He'd rather talk about. Uh, stopping the apocalypse. I also think that he uses his relationship with the father as a modality for um, mm -hmm. triangling. And he'll say to like Diego, like, well, Diego, the reason you're acting like this is because you thought that you're, you were mad that dad didn't love you. Mm -hmm. And then Diego will say, will be incited by that and will say, well, the only reason you are being team leader is because you um, you are still trying to impress dad. So they're both using the relationship mm. with the father as a means of triangling and not talking about mm. their own mm. relationship. Interesting. So I, I went with the, more of the TV show view of it. Okay. Um, and so I, I have two answers for this, actually technically three. Um, I think Vanya, um, to all of her, uh, to all of her siblings, falls into this in the TV show. I mean, because mm -hmm. she's just like, she, I mean, she never pursues her own interests, you know, until she's forced to. Really, she's just always kind of like putting uh, people in front of her. Um, and I guess, would you agree with that? With yeah, the TV show one? okay. And then, okay, I feel like I'm very proud of myself for thinking of this one. Um, I think it's Ben to Klaus. Um, oh! Because, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> because Ben needs more love! And the actor that plays Ben, oh my gosh, I love him. So I'm kind of excited with how the season left off, like, to where he's going to be. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, Klaus doesn't ask him how he's doing. Like, you know, what would he, how would he do a certain situation or, like, I don't know. I think if I could talk to the dead, I would like to know what they had to say. I mean, I feel like I would, I mean, if it was like today, I'd start a podcast with the dead. <laughs> then, you know, and just talk all about them because I think that their lives would be more interesting than my own. Um, but that is not the relationship okay. they have. Yeah. And, and Ben's a very good listener and he's out to help his brother. Yeah, that's nice. I'd listen to a podcast with any one of the uh, Umbrella Academy members. I listen to all yes. of their podcasts. I think they all are very insightful. Yeah. You know what? I wouldn't listen it's, to You know, like, boy. they're all... Uh, you know, I, I could. I could. I could listen. I could listen. He just His podcast would just be updates of what's happening on the moon. <laughs> not, not much is happening today. <laughs> it's like David know. Lynch's weather. <laughs> um, <laughs> terrible. Terrible. Uh, yeah. 
All right. So we're 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 winding down here a little bit, but we 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 have like a couple of scenes from the comics that we wanted to talk about. That's right. And so our job is going to be to listen to the scenario and then we will counsel the different individuals from the Umbrella Academy on how they could have handled the situation, maybe differently, maybe a little bit better. So let's see. All right, give us a, give us a scenario, Lisa. I'm ready. Okay. After skipping out on her father's funeral for an orchestra audition, Vanya sees that there is some commotion down at Carnival Pier and assumes correctly that her family is at the center of it. On impulse, she decides to go and assist in any way that she can, despite not having powers. She is met by Kraken, who is immediately goes into a conflictual posture, telling her that she has no business being there after what she had done and dismisses her. Here's a quote. The only thing you're good to do is help get us killed. And there's nothing you can tell me that I want to hear. I used to think I had a sister, but now I have nobody. Get lost. Brutal. Brutal. So rude. So, right. And that happens in first, volume one, by the way, right? Yes, so, this happened in volume one. Yeah. So first things first, was Diego correct that she had no business being there <sighs> after skipping out on the father's funeral? I mean, I don't think that's the issue. I mean, Vanya is such an interesting character. And in some ways, when you first start reading the, the um, comic or watching the TV show, you, she kind of is your gateway character. She's quote unquote, the normal one. Um, mm -hmm. And in the comic, as she uh, falls under the sway of the count, um, you know she she has to relive how she has been rejected over and over and over again uh, by her family because she cannot help in these scenarios. She can't, you know, go save the Eiffel Tower with her family because she would die. And Diego is right in this moment that she is posing. Uh, uh, a threat to them by being helpless and a target. But does he have to behave that way? Does he have to respond in such a fashion? Yeah. If they had dealt with these things earlier on in their childhood, and as they grew up, if they had defined their roles a little bit better, if they had incorporated her uh, in a some meaningful way, rather than continuously pushing her away, I think this mm -hmm. conversation doesn't even have to happen at this moment. Yeah, I definitely think that he is triangling and saying that she's in the way coming to this mission where really what the issue is, is his feelings were hurt that she didn't show up for her family and come to the funeral. Yeah. I I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that he should have moved her somewhere safe and then been like, I'm going to come back to you later. I can't. You know, let's let's talk about this later. But he didn't do that. But I think ultimately, I think Vanya made a mistake because that family is toxic and she should just find whatever closure she might need um, or and just get the heck out of there. Um, because if somebody did that to me my whole life um, and I went to a therapist, I think they would definitely say, like, you need to just do you like they're not going to change. You yeah, need to just would. move forward. You know, like the book was her doing her. Now, yeah, yeah, it was at the expense of her them relationships, yeah, and their relationships. Uh, but you know, I feel like she was on that way. But again, like it just comes down to these wounds that are built over a lifetime cannot mm. be resolved in a battlefield. Yeah, one thing that Dr. Roberta would say is that. In order to um, have more capacity for your own emotional sponge, it is important for you to resolve your issues with your family of origin. Because if you are walking around with unresolved anxiety, then that is less emotional capacity for any other families you might join, any other groups that you might join. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that you have to heal every single relationship that you've ever been in to in order to process your own emotions. Um, but I do think that, like, I think that Liz is right. I think that she should just, ex like, there's no point of trying to change the behavior of others, especially if, like, it's a, she has this, Kraken is giving her this predictable 
result of I'm going to be in conflict with you over this every single time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. So, so what, what advice would we have for Vanya going forward then to just go like, Hey, you know, take it, take a hint lady. And no, I mean, I think that if she, if she needs closure, which this applies to real life too, and, and what mm -hmm. you're saying, you know, if she needs closure, then um, she needs to try and seek that out knowing right. that she might not get answers. But I think the act of trying already starts a healing process. You just have to know that you might not like what you hear. Um, you might hear what you didn't expect and, um, or you might get nothing. And yeah. it's at that point you have to move on. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have time for like one more scenario sure. before we have to w wind things down a little bit. Uh, and I'm excited about this scenario because this is one of my favorite moments in the comic. Okay, uh, this is also this is also from volume one. In chapter five of the first volume, rumor brings up a coffee for Space Boy chilling on the roof. Space Boy mm -hmm. sees that rumor has put on her domino mask and makes a comment of surprise. Rumor says it makes her feel more like herself, and he responds, "More like yourself, or who you think you're supposed to be." Ooh. Basic self or functional self? Hmm, interesting. Rumor is hurt by it, accusing him of playing team leader. She says that she's not worried about anything other than her daughter. Space boy can't deal. Again, the conversation goes back to her power. She gets mad. He says, look, I'd love to worry about family, but with a body like mine, that's never going to happen. All he has is his hero self. So is such conflict necessary for the growth of these characters? Brad, you said this was your favorite moment. What are your thoughts? Well, this is kind of what I was uh, talking about earlier with Space Boy Luther uh, and how because of what transformation he's gone through, because he is a, you know, a human head on a gorilla body, um, you know, he does not have the option of what he would what he perceives uh, as, again, quote unquote, a normal relationship with anybody. So he's confronting rumor and saying, you know, like, you know, your daughter's Claire, right? You know, he, he doesn't, he doesn't even have the strength to remember the child's name. He barely remembers it, uh, her name. And um, th this, you know, he has to tell her like, you know, this is all I've got. Now, I think that's a little bit of an excuse. I think there's some self-loathing going on in there too. Um, I think he could find people, especially in this world that Gerard Way and Gabriel Ball have developed. I'm sure there's somebody out there who could be compatible for Space Boy. But in this moment, it's a heck of a slap towards the rumor, who then kind of diffuses it by using her power and saying, you know, there was a rumor that once upon a time you wanted to kiss me. And they kiss. <sighs> yeah. I mean, I felt like... I felt like once again, Allison was not wanting to deal with his feelings and asking him, why do you feel this way? And taking it a little bit further. Um, instead, she deflected and went back to her own self. And then also, and I don't mean to stir up some controversy, True. but I think that if, um, you know, using her power to have somebody kiss her, like that's an issue of kind of consent like she and i think if she was a guy character then somebody reading it would have a different reaction yes i agree uh, so i i mean i i think she is really the the poison in that piece but but just to say uh, the one the the netflix version she does have a change of heart like you said but in this volume one you know i i think she does fit that under functioning role pretty tightly yeah yeah it's that's a it's a hard scene to read, and even the version of it that's in, in, in uh, the television show is an uncomfortable scene. But thankfully, by the end of that first season, uh, I think there's some mending there that actually happens that doesn't happen in the comic book, at least not in the first two volumes. I don't know, if you, like I can, I don't know if you could actually fix what rumor had said though, because like you, that's a complete over. Like if let's say he didn't want didn't ever have a crush on her and he didn't ever want to kiss her. And now she's inserted into his narrative, this unrequited love. Yeah. 
that, I mean, there's no going back from that. There's no correcting that. So what would our advice be in this situation? My <laughs> advice would be, well, to Space Boy, I want to echo your advice of, if you feel like you're a weirdo, yeah. then find someone. Find some weirdos. Find someone who loves a weirdo like you. Um, I think like my like one of my favorite uh, like advice that I give to my friends who are uh, out in the dating world is like be aggressively yourself because you're trying to narrow the whole world down to one person who can deal with your BS. You know, so if you go, like, if you go on a date and you wear something that you're never going to wear and you say everything through a filter of things you would never want people to think that you would think or say, yeah, then you're never going to find that special one person. So I, to me, I think that, uh, like, an enormous monkey body is a beautiful filter for you to say, like, hey, if you want to be with me, you have to be with someone who's got a giant monkey body and that'll really narrow it down. Yeah. To yeah. somebody special. For sure. I mean, I, I agree with that. I agree with all that. Yeah. Yes. I do think that you should find somebody who loves you for who you are. And um, I hope that Luther becomes a lot more comfortable um, in his skin because he is, he's quite a lovable guy. Um, no. And Sorry, uh, I'm, I'm an interrupter. That's another thing that I do. Um, <laughs> no, you're fine. But I, I think the challenge for the Umbrella Academy for the seven is that you know they were raised to be a team and they were way, raised to act on uh, Hargreaves' will, and so they're they're a family and they're a team, but they've never had an opportunity to grow into who they are apart from each other. And so these conflicts that have developed in childhood have cemented in adulthood. And I, I think they need to have some serious like shattering. I think there needs to be a break. Yeah. Oh, you think that it should, they should have one big blowout? I don't know about a blowout, but I think they need to go off. Like, you know, Vanya went off and wrote her book. Like, I think they need oh, to have some time apart. Time apart. Can, we, they need can I just make a point blowout. here? Yeah. Uh, Brad, Brad's an only child. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's true. True. yeah. I think I think disgusting. <laughs> I don't of that. So I think your your form of resolving conflict might I don't know if I would make Distance. my brother go away and have like a huge fight, but <laughs> I think you need to like take some time away from your brother. He's no good for you. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm already in Maryland when he's in Texas, so we we've That's done that. Perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> you followed my advice already. Um, my default posture with my family is distance and, and it's an emotional distance and it's not necessarily a physical distance, uh, I, I, yeah. but you know, I, to, to me, it goes down to like, I think that they need to be made aware of these postures that they're, they're doing impulsively so that they can then choose to do a better, more productive posture. Like, and I think that that's what the Bowens family systems theory is all about of going like, well, what, what of your behavior is what you're choosing to do? And what of your behavior is just a, a bad habit that mm -hmm. has been trained into you by your evil alien dad. Mm -hmm. Not an alien on the TV show. <laughs> Maybe, we don't know. <laughs> um, so we always like to end our discussions um, talking about what we've learned from the characters in the comic book and and from uh, Roberta M. Gilbert with the family systems theory. And what of these ideas would we like to adapt to make our own relationships better? Ooh. Since you're our guest. Oh, <laughs> you put me on the top first? No, you okay. just go first. I'll go second. Oh, that sounds fair. Uh, I'll go first. <laughs> He's going first. Um, like this by all means is not a perfect book. If if you've read this book, there are some of her ideas that are kind of old fashioned and um and stuff like that. But what I find particularly useful is the idea that emotions are part of your autonomic function. And so a lot of times when you're having an emotion, you put blame on that emotion. Like either the emotion is my fault 
or the emotion is the fault of the person who I feel is inciting those emotions. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about, well, the emotion is just part of my autonomic function and is therefore blameless. Mm -hmm. I find it easier to kind of take myself out of the situation and kind of process some of that anxiety water on my own. So I can then go back to my relationship with a more calmed emotional state. Mm -hmm. And also I think that when you are with someone, like if, like I, if I'm with Brad and I say something conflictual because I'm, I'm not being my best self and he starts distancing, I can, I can go like, you know, that's not like that emotion that he's having at me is part of his autonomic function. And that, it's not his fault and it's and it's not my fault does that make sense and then and then I, like, we can both no. I mean, I mean, how would you say, like i have a short attention span how would you say it in one sentence i would say like i like the idea of going i can choose my i can choose the best behavior o over my impulse my emotional impulse like if i find myself getting conflictual i can say that's an emotional impulse that's not a good you know for, for me, the benefit of a book like this is it gives you terminology to help you look inward. And so I do love now having, you know, the ideas of conflict, distancing, triangling to be able to go like, okay, well, how am I behaving in this moment? I know I'm a distancer, like that, you know, that's what I responded to, but you know, am I being a distancer now or am I triangling? Am I looking for problems elsewhere? You know, um, that, that's what I've taken away from it. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think from the book perspective, um, I definitely take away like that out of body experience where, you know, your when your emotions are fully raging, um, being able to recognize that so that you can feel like you have some control over it. Um, although I will say that like my, my takeaway from the Umbrella Academy as a television show, as a series, um in the comic uh my takeaway is a bit different which i think is still pretty heavy um it doesn't relate to the um self-help book as much but um i would say that one thing that kind of happens to them is that like when your powers when you lose your powers or you have a huge life change it's kind of there he's basically jarred away so he's like, telling a story about like how do you adapt to that mm. you know because i think like in the all the versions of umbrella the umbrella academy um you know some people have their powers taken away and they're having to deal with that and you know or some people just got powers and then figuring out how to deal with that too um i, I think it's just really interesting because it's kind of like with the you know the situation that we're in right now like everybody in the world we got our lives turned upside down and like how are we adapting to that uh, so yeah. it's, a, it's a very reflective moment for me, I think, watching the show and, and thinking about it in real life. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, like, in if you want your relationships to last, whether that's familial or romantic, communication is key. And you need to be letting the others know how you're feeling. And when they let you know how they're feeling, you have to be open and listening and, and ready to absorb. Right. You don't want to blindside somebody with an emotion that you've been having privately. Yeah. That you that you're the story you're telling yourself is everybody knows I'm getting madder and madder when in reality everybody thinks you're functioning just fine. Right, right. I mean, um, I would really like to see them all like get on Twitter and then just use gifts to explain how they feel like each character. Like I'm so curious on Oh, that's <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. Pick. I still want their podcasts. <laughs> Yes. All right, Lisa, that's going to do it for us. We're wrapping up. That's right. Liz, this was literally the most fun. We love having you as a guest. And we also super love everything that she and Jimmy make, Aww. particularly Rights of Terror. I think that this is like such, it is so in your voice and such a triumph. And there's literally, you will never find anybody with their voice. It is so extraordinarily special. Yeah. Aww. So, nice. Liz. For everyone watching, where can they find you, like social media wise, all that good where stuff? Where can they buy your book? Do you know where they can buy yeah. Your book? Um, well, before I say anything, I just want to say thank you for having me on. I'm truly a huge fan of your podcast. And 
Um, not only do I learn about comics that I already love through comic books counseling, couples counseling, um, I also kind of like, if there's a comic that you guys are covering that I don't know about, I learn about it too, because you guys cover yes. all the bases. So I, I recommend your podcast for, for everybody. Um, and for you can find me, you can find me at Cuddles and Rage anywhere and everywhere. Um, and you can also follow my podcast because it's 2020. Everybody has a podcast. <laughs> it's, it's, great. Called, it's called People I Think Are Cool, where I literally interview people that I think are cool. And Brad and Lisa have been on the show, uh, Brad, multiple times um, because they just keep getting cooler and cooler. So, um, yeah, <laughs> just follow me at Cuddles and Rage and uh, definitely check out Bites of Terror. Uh, it's been really interesting having a book come out during a pandemic. So, <laughs> I love having events like this going online uh, so you can still recreate that con experience. Yeah. 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 Brad, where can where can our viewers of this panel send their words of affirmation to you? Uh, well, you can find me on all social medias at MouthDork. Uh, of course, you can follow the podcast at CBCC Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Um, we have just wrapped up a conversation on Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon using Roberta M. Gilbert's Extraordinary Relationships. Uh, we're gonna cover next week, uh, Laura Dean keeps breaking up for, uh, breaking up with me uh, from Marika Tomaki. We love this one. And Rosemary Valero O'Connell from First, Second Books. It's an amazing book. Love, love, love that. We super wanna thank Leslie and Sam from who's behind the scenes making this panel happen. If you have any words of affirmation for Awesome Con and the awesome people, uh, who have been putting it together. It's at AwesomeCon on Twitter. Yeah, and Lisa, they're going to want to send words of affirmation to you. Where are they going to do that? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Twitter, Instagram. Oh, and I almost said on Letterboxd. I'm not good about updating my Letterboxd. <laughs> Should be. Yeah. I know, I'm the worst. Uh, but until next time, guys, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open.